Howdy leadership scholars, welcome back to storming. So you may have looked on the module and thought, okay, Dr. Jen, decision-making and problem solving, how is that storming? Well, let me tell you. So for me in my head, how I see this is when decisions are not made in the correct format. So we're gonna get into, do you make a decision on an individual level or do you include teams? How much do you include your team, right? When that choice doesn't happen correctly, it leads to conflict. And if you are in the middle of a crisis, if you're in the middle of a problem, right? And you're not taking the time to go through the steps, the essential problem solving steps for a team, then that's going to create conflict, right? So to me, this makes a lot of sense in this module because you need to have a plan in place as a team so that you don't get I guess, mud down in the bog of decision-making and problem solving. So that's why it is in storming. So working through and developing a plan before it gets to that point. Okay, so when we think about this, what is a decision? A decision is just a choice made from available alternatives. I wonder, maybe we should do a social experiment. How many decisions do you make in a day? I mean, thousands, right? Even the decision to get out of bed. What's the alternative? Stay in bed, right? Do I shower? Do I wash my hair today? Or do I make it a second uh, dirty hair day, (laughs) right? All these little decisions that you make on an individual basis, um, sometimes they can be pretty impactful. And so when you think about decision making it's actually the process of so a decision is is the choice you make decision making is the process of choosing the action and so as a member of a team you have the opportunity to figure out how you as a team will make decisions so what is the decision making process you will engage in as a team in order to either make a easy decision or maybe it's a decision about a potential problem so there's some different categories of decisions i kind of like this Um, we think about programmed decisions from a a work-related or a teams-related opportunity it's these situations that occur often enough for rules, guidelines, practices, all that to be developed and applied for all future issues. So if you have a situation that keeps occurring, well, then you can say, all right, in the future, this is how we are going to figure out this decision. Whether it's admittance into a, well, let's say for a, undergraduates, right? Undergraduate program or um, graduate program. What is our rubric? How are we going to make this decision? And those stay pretty steady. They only change if there's an outside force that changes it. So when um, the Supreme Court struck down um, affirmative action again in admission for higher education, thanks to Giggum Harvard, um, It's that idea that, okay, we had a way to do it based on, you know, whether we're going to decide whether you get in or not based on all these criteria. Now that one of the criterion has been taken away, now we have to go in and redo this programmed decision. So if you have something that you're consistently doing as a team, then it makes a lot of sense to have specific guidelines for that decision. Alternatively, we have non-programmed decisions. This is when the world turns a little sideways, right? And so if something crazy out of left field happens, if something happens that you're not quite sure exactly what's happening, but you've got to make a decision, um, there's no structure to it, maybe no rhyme or reason, um, but it still has really important consequences and there's not a procedure 
right? You still have to make a decision. And on that instance of these two decisions, you've got to do the why afterwards. So with program decisions, the why happens before. Why are we doing this? We have to do this all the time. We need it systematic. We need to make sure that it is, um, it's equitable. Non-program decisions is we made this decision. This is why we made this decision. So it kind of comes on the back end. Does that make sense? So you think about there are program decisions that you make in your everyday life, like getting out of bed or not, right? You may say, well, if I don't have anything to do besides listen to Dr. Jen's lectures, I can do that in bed in my pajamas. So that's where I'm gonna stay, right? But if you know you also have to get out and do things, well, then you're gonna get out of bed and listen to the lecture at a different time. Non-programmed things are those crazy things that come out of left field, like trying to decide what you're gonna wear. Well, in Texas in the summer, you're probably gonna wear something that's cooler. But maybe we have a crazy freak rainstorm that happens. And which, oh boy, wouldn't that be nice? Well, you've got to change what you're going to wear, right? Based on the weather, you got to make sure you have an umbrella or a rain jacket. So that's kind of that difference. You with me? Okay. So when it comes to decisions and decision making, the things that we deal with every day as leaders, as, as people, mostly are uncertain, right? That require those ideas of, I don't know how I'm going to handle this, but I got to make a decision quickly, or I need to figure out how I'm going to make the decision. And because of this, we need a way to figure out how do we make decisions? Do we do it ourselves? Do we include other people? Do we get their opinions? Do we listen to their opinions and then make the decision? How does this work? So, this needs to happen if the decision is difficult to make you've got to make sure that you are making the decision in the correct way if the situation is continually changing you've got to understand how does that impact your decision if the information is unclear so those things that we talked about if you're having to think about different points of view well that might change on how you make the decision and how many people you involve so one way to kind of figure out all this mess because it is a mess is to work through normative decision making so you may have heard this as the room yago decision-making tree. If you take a look at this, you're like, oh, too many words, too many lines. Don't freak out. To me, this is like a dichotomous key on how to make a decision. So stay with me. If you remember dichotomous keys, when you were in biology, it was trying to figure out what genus or species something belongs to. So it's basically yes or no questions as you go through. So here's where we start. Over on the left-hand side, that QR, quality, requirement. So how important, high or low, is the technical quality of the decision? So does it require expertise? Does it require a technical knowledge? Does it require systematic review? Okay, if it, if it does, that's high. If it doesn't, then it's low. Then based on that, you go to the next. See our little CRs there? Commitment requirement. How important is, and I hate this word subordinate, but follower, teammate, whatever you wanna put in there, commitment to the decision. So how much buy-in do you need? How much commitment do you need from them? Do you need a lot of commitment? Okay, then you go to that next line up there on the high. Oh, I can do this, can't I? You can see that, hooray! You go up here. If it is a low commitment, then you come down here. Now, only if it's a high commitment do you ask, how much information does the leader have? So does the leader themselves have all the information needed? If yes, then you go here. If no, then you go down here. Then based on here, you ask the next question. Is the problem structured? If yes, shoot you up here. If no, see it while we're branching. Okay, now down here, if you've said there's low quality requirement and here it is not important that the 
a subordinate have commitment, you flip all the way here to CP, the commitment probability. So commitment probability is if you were to make the decision by yourself, how likely will your teammates actually agree with you and be on board, right? And so if it is pretty darn likely, boom, you shoot over here to this AI or A1. We'll, we'll talk what that means. If it is not at all likely, then it shoots you here to G. Okay, so that one's pretty easy. But if you're still up here, then you go to the next question, the goal congruence. So do subordinates or teammates share the organizational goals or team goal to be obtained in solving the problems? Based on that, you then go to subordinate conflict or teammate conflict. Is conflict among the team over preferred solutions likely? Are people going to get mad? Are they going to engage in conflict? You see why we have this in storming. Then based on that, it goes to that last category of subordinate information. And the subordinate information is, do your teammates have the information to help you make a high quality decision? If yes, it shoots you one way. If no, it shoots you the other. So for decisions that aren't instantaneous because we know some have to be made quickly. If you have a little time and you can take a breath, you can say, how should I make this decision? Should it be all me? Should it be my team has some influence and then I make the decision? Should it just be a team decision? How should we make this decision? So you follow this key, this dichotomous key all the way over and A1 is there at the top is autocratic. So you need to make the decision, right? So there on CP, if the commitment is likely that your teammate teammates are going to actually be like, yep, that decision needs to be made. You're the one that needs to make it, go for it. Then boom, you make the decision, right? You don't second guess, you make the decision. The A1 is also down there at the bottom, which is interesting too. But again, it, both of those instances go with, will your team support you? Whatever decision you make, will your team support you? And that could be in a team situation that you are the expert, right? You are the one in charge, or it's a highly time sensitive matter, but you've worked through conflict, you've engaged in these things. And so you're, you're going to have that support of your team. The next one is G. So you're going to see that there in a couple of different spots, kind of the first third, uh, the middle third, and then there at the very bottom. G means you bring your team together, you brainstorm together what needs to happen right? It could be alternative decisions. It could be what is the situation and everyone kind of puts in their information on the situation. But on G, you choose together. You work it out and you choose together. So not one person is making the decision. So it could be by consensus, like we talked about in the five dysfunctions. It could be by voting, whatever it is, you work together. Now, C2, so CII there, it is you consult the group on alternatives together. So you bring the group, your team together, and you say, okay, these are all the possible decisions that can be made. What do you think about these decisions? Do you like option A? Why do you like option A? Do you like option B? Why do you like option B? And at this point, they can talk to each other, okay? So the team is together. Someone can say, yeah, option B, I don't think that's gonna work for me because of this. And someone could say, well, actually it'd work better for me because of that. And so ultimately on this one, you have to make the decision. So the team doesn't make it together, but they come together to discuss all the alternatives, right? We've talked about G. Then we've talked about AI, I, okay? So this is when you as the head of the team, um, you collect information from everyone, but not in a group setting. So you'll go into, you know, 
Jason's office and say, hey, Jason, I've got a decision to make. What are your thoughts on this? Then you go into Sarah's office. Hey, Sarah, I've got a decision to make. What are your thoughts? And then you go to Devin's office and you say, hey, Devin, I've got a decision to make. What are your thoughts? Okay. Then you as the leader or maybe team leader at that time, you take all of that information, but you ultimately make the decision. Then the last one that we haven't talked about there is that CI, which is consulting information individually, and then talk about to other people the other decisions. So you say, okay, I've got these alternatives. What do you think about alternative A, alternative B, alternative C? but you do it on an individual level, then you ultimately decide. So it's kind of like G, except you are the one making the decision. The group doesn't make the decision. Does that make sense? So as you go through this normative decision-making model, it is how should I make the decision? Not what should the decision be, but how should I do it? Should I do it more from a leader perspective or should I do it more from a team perspective? The other decision-making model that we talk about um, in our undergraduate classes, because let's be honest, that's super complicated, is the um, Leadership Continuum by Tannenbaum and Schmidt. And that one is telling, selling, testing, joining, and consulting. No, consulting and then joining. And that is the truly continuum between complete autocratic directive decisions and complete group-centered decisions. So if you look at this Vroom and Yago and be like, no, this is way too complicated, then look up the Tannenbaum and Schmidt leadership continuum because that might be your bag, maybe a little bit better. So let's talk a little bit about problem solving. So a lot of decisions help with how are we going to solve a problem, right? So why is problem solving so important? Well, we all got problems, right? We got 99 problems. So how do we work as a team to solve these problems together? Well, there's some advantage of working together. You've got shared knowledge. You've got shared experiences. So that diversity of knowledge will broaden the alternatives, right? You're going to have more voices. So somewhere amongst that cacophony of voices, the, the real great answer is probably there. It actually leads people to understand the, the not only the why did this happen, how did we get to this point, but the whiffum of why is it in it, what's in it for me. And so people are more likely to be like, yeah, I was a part of that. And so I helped solve the problem, therefore I am going to be a, an advocate for this decision that we made. So it really helps in that, that advocacy section. And members are willing to take more risks and they're willing to kind of put themselves out there because you've worked through right that conflict. People know your group member role. Um, you're you're going to come up with a decision that's not too far to the left or not too far to the right. It's going to be right in the middle. It's going to be in that sweet spot of decision making where a lot of alternative ideas have been processed together. So it's really, there's some really great advantages. Now, as well, um, usually, not always, but usually collective judgment is better than one individual's, right? Because we have a myopic view of the world. We only have our experiences. We only have our view. So in order to not be ethnocentric, we need other perspectives to get that bigger picture to see all of the different colors. Now, we also know there's some limitations to using a group, right? So sometimes if you are in maybe that dysfunction of a, a team where you haven't built trust and there's some conflict, you may feel that pressure to conform. And so you're not going to engage. Um, maybe you just support the dominator, right? The one, the, the bully, the jerk we talked about. So one person can absolutely usurp the problem solving process and become very problematic. Or, man, let's just call a spade a spade. It takes a lot of time. 
when you've got more than one person making a decision, it, it can be, oh, just think about it. You're in the car, right? Maybe with your family, maybe with a group of friends. And someone asked the awful question, where should we eat? Right? Did you actually groan when you heard that? Um, well, how about this? How about this? How about this? No one's really saying anything or everyone's silent and it takes more time. So someone said, hey, a burger sounds good. Let's go. Um, it, you know, it's probably one of the worst or what should we watch? <laughs> the hubs and I do that all the time. Hey, what show do we want to start binging? Um, well, what about this? How about this? What about this? And then if you add the child onto it, holy moly, right? Don't ask the dog's opinions either because they probably have one. It just takes a lot of time. So that could be a limitation. Or if someone is an expert, right? And really, according to Vroom Jago, they should be the one making the decision because they have all of that knowledge and no one else really needs to chime in. If that expert is overpowered by the dominator or the moral majority or whatever, um, that could absolutely be detrimental to the correctness or the effectiveness of the decision. So we do have some natural tendencies we use to solve problems. I love this. This is bringing back some group member roles. It's bringing back personality. It's bringing back these things to put it in a different context and also talk about some potential uh, conflict. So when we think about information gathering, so this is MBTI stuff, right? You could use sensation, right? This, you may prefer routine. You like details. You want all the facts. So going back to just the facts, ma'am, right? You want that information by your five senses, or you could be really intuitive. And so you see the bigger picture. Routine is not something that you need. You're okay with a little bit of ambiguity. Um, you are open to possibilities. You're open to change. You're open to changing your mind. Um, opinions work just as well for you <laughs> as facts. So those two different personality typologies see the world in such a different um, way that how they approach problem solving is very different, right? Evaluation is another. So it could be feeling, right? Um, do you accommodate yourselves to others? So do you put your personal feelings aside for harmony? All right, okay, I don't want to make a, a big issue out of this because I don't want conflict. Um, if you're okay with that, then that might be how you evaluate things. Or you may be a reason and intellectual. It's not about your, your head or your heart. It's about your head. And so you downplay that emotional. So if there's a problem, you engage it with your brain versus feeling that may engage with the heart. How's this going to affect other people? Well, how you are your alternatives for that decision are going to be very different based on how your brain is wired. So there's a lot of things that go into that from a team perspective. Now, I love this because I like sometimes to have specific steps on how to do things. So here is six steps in making a decision as a team if you are solving a problem, right? So if you've got a problem, you need to solve it. Maybe Vroom Jago has said, solve it as a team. This is how you do it. Number one, <laughs> in any good six step program, right? A 10 step program um, is first, you gotta recognize there's a problem. So recognizing that there has to be a decision made. So looking at that, it could be, um, how do you how do you do that right you compare against what's going on okay i think we need to make a decision on this we've got a problem what's uh, what else is going on here you monitor for things that may be starting to creak and groan a little bit like oh this may end up being a problem let's take a look at this right i think we need to probably make a decision before this gets any worse um maybe it could be um, who says this is a problem? Who caused the problem? Um, who will it affect? Okay, kind of gathering all that information. Oops, there. Diagnosing and, and analyzing the, ca the, the causes there too in, includes that. Um, 
who has done something about it, um, what has happened or what will happen, what are the symptoms, what are the consequences. I don't know why this keeps popping up fast. Okay, developing alternatives. When you look at this, we say, all right, now, what are our different decisions we can make? What are the alternatives to this problem? Um, when we talk about this from an ethical point of view, Kidder and, well, Kidder's probably one of the, the better ones on this. He says there's usually a, a trilemma. You know, you've got the right versus wrong, the right versus right, the wrong versus wrong. And so you have to look and say, what are our intended consequences? What are our unintended consequences um, of all of these actions? And then we select the alternative right we make a decision so many teams don't actually get to step four they think about it they hem and haw they go back and forth but no decision is ever made so you've got to actually do the thing you've got to make the decision then you implement it right this is what we're going to do this is the alternative that we chose this is how we're going to solve the problem you put it into practice. You put it into play. Oh, goodness gracious. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm having, it's a comedy of errors over here today. And then evaluate and feedback. So when we talk about here in the team development process, adjourning is essential. When you make a decision, you choose an alternative, you try to solve the problem, you put it into play, then you have to evaluate, did it work? If it didn't work, guess what? You got to go to back to step number one and say, okay, we're still having a problem. How do we still know that there's a problem? Well, we're looking around us. We're seeing that the, the issue was not solved. So then we have to say, why wasn't that solved? So let's go back and say, um, was it because we didn't do it in a timely manner? Was it done because maybe we implemented this on a Monday, but it needed to be implemented on a Friday to work? You go back and develop more alternatives. You sort through those alternatives and figure out the one you're going to go with. Then you put it into play again. And then you evaluate it. Maybe this time it worked. And if it worked, you get to stop, right? If it didn't, you keep going on this loop until you make it happen. So I really like this one, like I said, because it gives you some six pretty definitive steps on how do we solve the problem that include realizing it's a problem all the way back to evaluating when you put that together. So kind of the, the summary for this lecture. First, figure out, right? How are you going to make the decision? Does it need to be just one or two people together? Does it need to be the whole team? How can we make this happen? Then make the decision. Solve the problem. When we engage in this, especially in crisis, We've got to understand that it is essential to have a, that trust. It's essential to be able to work through alternative and differing viewpoints to engage in conflict. And that's the dogs telling me it's time to stop this lecture. <laughs> See you in the next module for norming.